So the title that I've chosen for the sermon today is Pray Like Jesus Prayed, because the scripture text that you just heard read, the whole, and thank you, Flo, the whole chapter of chapter 17 is a prayer of Jesus Christ. First, I, I want to start with a quote from the famous the theologian Oswald Chambers. You may know him from his book, My Utmost for His Highest. He, was, he thrived around the um, late 1800s and early 1900s. His quote in that, from that book is about prayer. And we know that the, the scripture says in 1 Thessalonians that, that we ought to pray without ceasing. So that just means that we ought to be continually praying. And Oswald Chambers says in his book, his quote is, if we think of prayer as the breath in our lungs and the blood from our hearts, we think rightly. The blood flows ceaselessly and breathing continues ceaselessly. We are not conscious of it, but it, all, it is always going on. We are not always conscious of Jesus keeping us in perfect joint with God. That's the way that Oswald says, Jesus keeping us in right relationship with God. And he goes on, he says, but if we are obeying him, obeying Jesus, he always is keeping us in right relationship. And then he goes on, he says this, he says, prayer is not an exercise, it is the life. Chambers has expressed that this thought that the Bible has of praying without ceasing so very eloquently when he says that prayer is the life. But it has, it's not any different than I've always thought of prayer to be when I wrote, when I read 1 Thessalonians 5.17, when it says, pray without ceasing, because prayer is the life that I live. And this entire text, as I said, is the prayer of Jesus Christ to the Father. Let me give you a quick example, because I don't want to go over time, but let me, let me give you a quick example of someone who is actually a negative example to what I am um, trying to put forth here when I say pray, like Jesus prayed. This has to do with a woman that I knew, I got to know, and um, she, um, when I first, when we were all, together actually around a lunch table getting to know one another, she spoke out and said, um, God would have me very soon to meet my husband. And I thought to myself, well, this is a, that's a good thing. You know, she has the sense that God is preparing her for her husband and preparing her husband for her. And that's, that's really a good thing. But um, as it turned out just a few months later and you know, I mean, you would have thought that this was the will of God coming forth. But within a few months, then she announced an engagement to this guy named Mateo, uh, a man named Mateo. And um, if to hear her speak about Mateo all the time, you would have most definitely, most definitely thought that this is the man that God had prepared for her to marry. But it so happened that um, by the end of that year uh, of my knowing her, first meeting her, this relationship with Mateo fell completely apart. Okay, so that's one thing. But then by the end of the next year, by the end of that summer, she was planning a marriage to another man. And then that wedding fell apart by the end of the summer, even though at the beginning of the summer, she was planning that wedding, the wedding. And then about one more year later, there was yet another new fiance. 
And this particular fiance had found them a beautiful house. And she had a couple of children and, you know, uh, a husband would have made the whole family complete. The right husband would have made the whole family complete. And you would have thought looking at that house that was maybe a, it was beautiful and affordable for a couple and everything that you would think that this was the blessing of the Lord for sure, except that I knew the history already. And... Um, that, that relationship fell apart as well. And then about one more year later, this woman was yet engaged to a fourth man. That's four fiancés that I know of <laughs> that the woman had been engaged to within a five-year period. And I'm not, as I said, trying, well, I'm not trying to gossip. As I said, I'm trying to give you a negative example I'm trying to give you an example of how God most definitely does not operate. If you listen to what's going on in this scripture today, and if, if you also listen to how that Oswald Chambers expressed, um, expressed that prayer is a life, and you're listening to what Jesus is saying in, in this scripture, then you'll definitely see that what this woman was going through was not an expression of God's will so much as it was an illustration or an expression of her will in her life rather than God's will. So let us look at the scripture text for today a little bit more closely. If we um, look at it, we'll see that Jesus actually prayed for three things. He prayed one, he prayed for himself. He, he prayed for his glorification. And then two, Jesus prayed for the faith community. Third, Jesus prayed for the union of the Father and the Son with all believers. That same faith community, the union of the, of, of the Father and the Son with the faith community in heavenly realms, in, in the kingdom of God. And when, as he prayed for these three things, then Jesus prayed also that his own life would cooperate and help to bring about or the, bring about the manifestation of the very things that Jesus was praying for. So first, as I said, he prayed for his glorification. In verse 1, we see that Jesus says, uh, he, he asked the Father, in particular, quote unquote, glorify thy son so that the son may glorify you. And it, it seems, um, you know, um, conceited or, or something, but, but we also may ask that just what Jesus asked, Father, glorify your daughter, glorify your son so that you may be glorified. I've learned in this life that as I would get up for morning prayers, that the first person that I need to pray for is myself. I need to get in right relationship with God so that I can pray rightly for anyone else. And, I, and, and so that I will pray in or, or be able to help in the power of God. I need to be in right relationship with God. So in praying for myself, I pray like Jesus prayed. So in verse uh, five, we see how Jesus glorifies the Father. Jesus prays in, in verse, actually that's verse four. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. The purpose for which Jesus lived on earth was, was to work the works that the Father gave him to do. We see that this then is his own life cooperating and helping to bring about the manifestation of the very thing that he is praying for. He lifts up before the Father the fact of finishing, finishing the work even though he has not yet even gone to the cross. But his life helps to bring about the reality of that prayer. The glorification of Jesus then is these 
are these three things. Jesus was sent to die on the cross, and Jesus was sent to be miraculously resurrected, and Jesus was sent to rise, royally ascending to the right hand of the Father, where he now is seated. So, as I said, the purpose of Jesus' life was to work the works of the Father, which were his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. And by doing this, Jesus showed us God in God's self, visibly in the flesh of humanity. See, we're going to join him there seated at the right hand of the Father and behold him face to face in his glorified body. Yes, he was here to walk the earth and walk with those that he walked with during that time, but Jesus' glorified body is the, is the, the purpose of Jesus, of, of the incarnation in the first place, that we would behold him face to face in all eternity, in humanity. Verse 20 reads, I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word. So in that verse then, even though Jesus is standing before his 12 disciples, professing these things and praying these things over them, in verse 20, he includes all of us. He includes all of you and he includes me in that verse. So that Jesus prays for all Christians in protection. He, Jesus prays for protection from the evil one that is from the devil. In verse 11, he just says, Holy Father, protect them. And then in verse 15, he asks, he says, I ask you to protect them from the evil one. And again, Jesus' own life cooperates with what he's praying for. He is blessed to protect his disciples. Verse 12 shows that. It says, while I was with them, I protected them. I guarded them. And then also Jesus is being real clear in this uh, prayer about what that protection actually is. It, it comes about by all believers being one in Jesus. Again, in verse 11, it says, Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, that is in the name of Jesus, so that they may be one as we are one. Verse 21 says that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us. So our protection as Christians, as the, as the Church of Jesus Christ here at Spencer and in the partnership and in the Church of Jesus Christ Universal, is that we are united. It is in our unity that we are one. And once again, Jesus has enabled this to occur. We are enabled by Jesus Christ to be one. Because Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. That's the King James Version. And then in the NLT Version, it says, those who make peace are happy because they will be called sons of God. I want to, to lift up in both of these versions, it's make peace peace. It's not keep the peace, it's make peace. So that those who are spiritually ma mature make peace. And I say spiritually ma mature because this word in the scripture that is for, is for son is in the Greek, Greek, excuse me, huios. I went to say the word before I said Greek. Anyway, the word is huios. And the word huios is the same word used for son as for Jesus. So Jesus says the son of God is weos. But in other Greek word, there are other Greek words to say son. You know, there are Greek, uh, Greek there are three other Greek words, I believe. There's, there's pidon and there's technon. Uh, pidon is for a very, very um, young um, 
a very young child, and technon is for a more mature one. But then huios is the very best type of offspring that we could be of God. So in this scripture where it says that they shall become son, be, be called sons of God, then Jesus is saying they shall be called mature offspring of God, because it just doesn't mean male or female, it means both. Mature offspring of God. So that's what I would always want to be, is a wheels of God. Glory, hallelujah. God can do that for me. So as we were, were to make pre peace then, and rather than keep the peace, I mean, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't mean that one Christian, when they know that they've been praying in the will of God, should just totally give up on what it, it is the disagreement with another Christian. But rather, what they should do is sit down together and discuss things and come to an agreement. They should make peace. That's what, what Jesus is talking about here in a mature way. Always loving one another as children of God, as sons of God. So now as we go on, we see in, in verse 22 that Jesus is also praying it says, the glory that you, the Father, have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one and we are one, as we are one. So Jesus gave the glory in order to enable the oneness of the church. We have that ability. Jesus gave the glory. So we always want to pray, not necessarily exactly what Jesus prayed, but not always, but we certainly always ought to pray like Jesus prayed. That is in the will of God and cooperating with God's will for our lives. Now, the third thing that Jesus paid for, prayed for and the very last and best thing, in my opinion, that Jesus prayed for was that Jesus, Jesus prayed for the union of the Father and the Son with all believers within the heavenly kingdom of God. Verse uh, 24 says, Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. So Jesus is praying that all Christians, all believers in him, see him, as I said, face to face, glory, hallelujah, in the heavenly realm, in the kingdom of God. He says, quote unquote, where I am. And that is seated at the right hand of the Father, royally enthroned next to God himself. The last two verses show that Jesus, who intimately knows the Father, has made the Father known on earth that we too may have a home with him in glory for all eternity. Verses 25 and 26 read, Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know you that you have sent, that you have sent me, excuse me. I made your name known to them and I will make it known so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. So as we pray like Jesus prayed, let us remember also the quote of Oswald Chambers because it's very, very pertinent and fitting of the scripture. It says, uh, Oswald said that prayer is not an exercise, it is the life. So this is the sum total of, of praying like Jesus prayed, praying in the will of God, cooperating with God's will for each of our lives. Christians are always to pray like Jesus prayed. Amen.